the town meeting, so it's really an honor to bring them up to the stage. So uh, again, another international team that come from Denmark. We have uh, Steen Svenholm and Klaus Larsen, who run editors of 9-11 uh, Facts, and they're going to tell us a little bit what, about what they've learned in combating um, conspiracy theories and something they learned about the minds of conspiracy theorists. So let's welcome to the stage. All right, thank you very much. Uh, it's been a tremendous three or four days, depending on how you count it, uh, and we're the last act. So it's uh, a thrill to see that there's still so many of you left. That only goes to show how dedicated you are, skeptics, or that the coffee is still free. <laughs> anyway, today, thanks for, uh, and the board for uh, choosing us. And uh, thanks for a lovely few days. My name is, uh, because you introduced us both, so it's, I am Steen Svenno, and this I'm is... I'm Klaus Larsen. I'm Larsen. Yeah! <laughs> By the way, this is uh, currently being uh, live-streamed on Facebook, so we would really appreciate a uh, big applause. <laughs> Well, together, Klaus and I have created the website 911facts.dk, where we investigate the many conspiracy theories concerning the terror attack on September 11, 2001. It's available in Danish and in English. So, come and visit. Along the way, we also began to look at the way uh, to look at why conspiracy theories emerge and why people become conspiracy theorists. We've come up with some quite interesting findings, we think, and we'll present one of these today, which we call the Harriet Syndrome. Conspiracy theorists claim that secret powerful groups are plotting world domination in various ways. But it isn't all about who killed Kennedy, Elvis and Princess Diana, aliens being stored in a freezer at Area 51, or our reptilian overlords. Other false beliefs are likewise based on conspiracy theories. Big Pharma is said to keep cures for St. Cain's secret, while superstition-based remedies are being oppressed. Doctors are said to vaccinate in order to secretly give children autism. The police and the legal system allegedly suppress the knowledge that psychics can solve crimes. And Holocaust deniers point to a, ma to a massive conspiracy of Jews and Zionists. So obviously we need to identify methods to limit the spreading of conspiracy theories. We must convince conspiracy theories that there is no conspiracy. The study of conspiracy theories and theorists is actually relatively new. But psychologists have made quite a progress in the past couple of decades. So the following is compiled from the existing body of psychological studies. Every one of us experiences loss of trust and subsequent loss of control to various degrees. When life offers the proverbial lemons such as divorces, sackings, financial losses, lost court cases or rejected applications, there are different ways to deal with this in order to regain control. One reaction would be to simply learn the lesson and move on. After all, failure and misfortune are part of life. Another reaction would be to start blaming external forces, such as management consists of incompetence, spouses are of dubious morals, the government is a bunch of fools. From there, it's a relatively small step to start believing that society is controlled, at least in part, by a group of people with sinister motives. However, given that there's no obvious evidence, the evidence of such a conspiracy must be inferred. These mechanisms have been established already fairly well in the existing academic literature. The following will be our findings. Because we have noticed a marked difference in the conspiracy theorists, which we have named the novice conspiracy theorist or type 1, and the evangelical conspiracy theorist type 2. The novice conspiracy theorist casts suspicion on selected flaws in society. Bush is blamed for oil wars in the Middle East, Vaccines cause autism, but the novice conspiracy theorist will also engage in conversation about the new play at the National Theatre, the trend in fashion, and other non-controversial issues. 
The knowledge conspiracy theorists will communicate with the theories to others, but also acknowledge that the theories exist in separation. One theory is not connected to or dependent on other theories. To the novice, conspiracy theories do not play any dominant role in his life, so he will most likely be reasoned with. The evangelical conspiracy theorist, on the other hand, casts suspicion on all flaws in society, real or perceived. The evangelical conspiracy theorist is a preacher, a prophet, one who can hardly talk about anything else. Everything is seen through a conspiracy lens, and everything is connected. If the CIA killed John F. Kennedy, then they also hide aliens in Area 51. If MI6 was ordered by Queen Elizabeth to kill Princess Diana, the Queen is, of course, also a reptilian. <laughs> Conspiracy theories must become the defining factor of his worldview and his identity. Not surprisingly, such extremist behavior often results in social exclusion, but this merely strengthens the evangelical conspiracy theorist in his belief. He believes he is telling the truth and is excommunicated for it. Given the social isolation and the conclusion that people who are trying to change his mind will take him away from his truth, there is little hope of changing the views of an evangelical conspiracy theorist. At the very least, it's complicated. But what happens here? Why do some only become novice conspiracy theorists, most seem to fall into this category, while others, a minority, but Nevertheless, very influential, become evangelicals. We believe, Klaus and I, that we have identified this factor. And we've <coughs> named it the Herod syndrome. It's named after Niels Herod, who we see at the top here in the middle. Um, he's a Danish physician. He's a professor emeritus in chemistry at the University of Copenhagen. And he's regarded by some to be Denmark's leading conspiracy theorist. His claim to fame is publishing a paper claiming the existence of so-called nanothermite in the dust of the World Trade Center. This substance was allegedly used to bring down the World Trade Center 1 and 2, and in particular World Trade Center 7. Niels Harris became what we consider an evangelical conspiracy theorist in 2006 by receiving three DVDs from an anonymous benefactor. On one of the DVDs, a clip was shown of the World Trade Center 7 collapsing. Niels Harry describes it as a life-changing event. To quote him, So when you see a building collapse in 6.5 seconds, and you're a scientist, you think, what? And then you have to watch it again. So I pressed the button 10 times, and my jaw dropped more and more. Since that day, I've not had a day off. The last part is, well, it's actually all a correct uh, quote, and the last part is very much true because Niels Herod has since that day given close to 400 lectures across the world and appeared on various television and radio stations. For the Herod syndrome to occur, two events must happen in succession. One, the individual must experience the social and mental conditioning of increasing loss of trust in personal and systemic relations with a subsequent loss of control. We call this preconditioning. Two, this individual must have an experience of such magnitude and influence that only the term revelation covers it. It's important to stress that this revelation can happen to both people who are not as conspiracy theorists and those who are not yet conspiracy theorists, shall we say, normal. You don't need to be a conspir novice conspiracy theorist first, but you do need to be preconditioned. And to trigger this revelation, a messenger is required. People do not seem to go from normal state or novice conspiracy theorist to evangelical conspiracy theorist on their own. No, there has to be a carrier of illumination. This messenger can take the form of a video, a lecture, a television show or the like, and is usually recommended by an already evangelical conspiracy theorist. The delivery is always, almost always the same, something like, watch this video on YouTube, then you'll understand everything Come to the lecture with me, Niels Herod is great. Here, read this book, it reveals the truth. And once experienced, the transformation is instantaneous. In one blinding moment, everything becomes clear. Not only are the everyday problems caused by a secret group 
No, everything in society throughout history have been one long connected string of conspiracies dedicated to achieving power over everything for all time. Yes, there are clear religious connotations here. The experience is comparable to the illumination of religious saints by angels acting as harbingers. The evangelical conspiracy theorists are clearly seeing themselves as a form of missionaries, even prophets and gurus. They describe themselves as oracles and being awoke, scolding non-believers to wake up sheeple and themselves as having a life-altering experience. Niels Herrick himself, he describes it this way, that 9-11 is the key to understanding it all. Once you understand his lecture, you're well on the way to a higher understanding of the world, and especially what is wrong with it. This enables the evangelical conspiracy theorist to begin putting together a vision of who are connected to whom and to why. And that's why you will end up with something like this. <laughs> to us sheeple, this is chaotic and incomprehensible. But to the woke ones, this is a true description of the world. Type 1 conspiracy theorists make up a considerable part of the population. But there's little evidence that the number of type 2 conspiracy theorists is very high. However, while type 1 conspiracy theorists have little influence on public discourse, type 2 conspiracy theorists have much greater influence, since they are the prime instigators of which conspiracy theories should be disseminated. Type 1 conspiracy theorists appear rather innocuous uh, and innocent. It's still possible to have a rational discussion with them and they're somewhat open to being wrong. Type 2 conspiracy theorists, however, have a far more aggressive and transboundary behavior. These differences are comparable to religious believers, where some have a moderate approach, while others, a much smaller group, are fundamentalist and extremist. The distinction between type 1 conspiracy theorists and type 2 conspiracy theorists could help us to a much better understanding of what to choose as solutions when we fight the spreading of the theories. What works for type 1 may not work for type 2 and vice versa. Type 1 conspiracy theorists can be reasoned with by educating them and using sensible, suitable, logical arguments. Type 2 conspiracy theorists may be reached since they, much to our surprise, uh, seem to copy good behavior. If we talk politely to them and listen to them, they scale back their verbal aggressions. But for both groups, it will require a lengthy, patient, and tolerant effort. There are no quick fixes to the problem of conspiracy theories. So, to sum up, before we can even begin to change the situation, we need to understand not only what conspiracy theories believe in, but also why they believe in. We think, Klaus and I, that we found small but crucial part of the puzzle. The existing literature explains why a person becomes a novice conspiracy theorist. The Herrick syndrome explains why a person becomes an evangelical conspiracy theorist. And before we round this off, uh, I'd just oh, like I, to... I, I, oh, you want to say something? Yes, okay. please. Uh, sure. Yes, the Herrick syndrome will be described in our article The Rhetoric of Conspiracy Theories in the Upcoming Issue of Chaos. That's an academic journal published by the Department of Religious History at the University of Copenhagen. Of course, that needs to be said. Before we round it up, I'd just like to finish with a story. You see, we're on a manuscript here, so we can say a lot in short time. But there's a specific reason why Klaus and I are here today. <laughs> because a couple of years ago, uh, there was a Danish conspiracy theorist, a so-called Tudor, who uh, stole two of our articles from our website and uh, put it up on his own website in his own name, changed it a bit, quite a lot actually, and uh, thus violated uh, copyright laws in Denmark. And uh, to put it shortly, we uh, uh, took him to court and uh, he lost and he had to pay. Yeah, thank you. turn out that way. He took it all away, so he had to pay. And he was actually uh, with someone else, but we just couldn't uh, prove uh, there's evidence, but we couldn't prove in court that they were two. Uh, so to sum it up, I can only say that we are here due to a conspiracy. 
<laughs> and we are, we could say we are here because we used the money to go here. All those $9,000, why not go here? So you could say actually that we are here as skeptics on a truth of scholarship. <laughs>